All right, so, so when, you, when you understand what I'm doing, just go ahead, go ahead and say it. You ready? Yeah, I heard hokey pokey eventually. We got there. The hokey pokey! And, and for those of you that are familiar with the dance, what, what is kind of the, the climax, the grand conclusion of this dance that we all know and love, the hokey pokey? Well, you put your right arm in, et cetera, until you get to your body. Or, or somebody said it, your whole self. You put your whole self in and you shake it all about. You do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around. And that's what it's all about. What is repentance? And how does a person know if they've truly repented from their sins or not? Do you ever look at your life and, and struggle maybe over whether you are really sincerely following God? I know a lot of people have had this struggle. Have I really repented? I have a quote here. It's from 1964 by Mr. Herbert Armstrong. He wrote in the Plain Truth magazine, too many commandment keepers have only been converted to the argument of keeping God's commandments and have never really experienced definite repentance. For a real conversion is a definite experience. Such people need to go to a private place alone with God and get to their knees to pour out their hearts to God and stay with it until they know they have really repented. These are powerful words, insightful words. Together with uh, faith, which I discussed last time I was here in a sermon, repentance is one of the key pillars for what, what it takes to enter into a lifelong covenant with God. What, what it is necessary to maintain the baptism covenant once we've entered it with him. It has to be there. Now we know repentance is necessary because of sin. It's like this big obstacle in this way, in the way. You know, when we've broken God's law, which we've all done because no one but Christ is perfect, now something has to be done to get rid of it. No, none of us can skip the step of repentance. Two key references from the book of Romans. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, so none of us is exempt. It's so Romans 3.23, everybody has sinned. And Romans 6.23, where Paul wrote, the wages of sin is death. So we've all sinned, and the wages of that, what we deserve for it is death. Until repentance takes place, there can't be forgiveness, and that cannot be dealt with. Major problem. So every one of us needs repentance to have a relationship with God. That, that is, before we can take advantage of the wonderful work of Jesus Christ and the deal, the covenant that he mediated for us by his sacrificial death, this is what's required on us. Coming up soon after the Feast of Trumpets, after next Sabbath, we'll have the Day of Atonement, a day which pictures and emphasizes the removal of sin, the cleansing from sin, being cleansed by the blood of Christ, and being set right with God. We understand that to be party to that covenant, repentance from us is required. It must take place to receive all the wonderful promises that we see in God's covenant. God's covenant, therefore, requires more than faith. It takes more than doing the right thing and more than believing. Our relationship with God cannot move forward without removing sin. It takes complete forgiveness because God will not, you could say cannot, forgive our sin without repentance on our part. So today we're going to review how the Bible defines repentance. We're going to see it's not just something that, that we do once, but it's a way of life that we have entered into if we've received the covenant. One that's based on a total mindset change and an enduring commitment to God. And the first thing you have to do is put your whole self in. Repentance has to be a wholehearted commitment. If you intentionally hold anything at all back from God, then you've not really entered his covenant. You have to commit up front, be willing to lay everything on the li line and say, God, you are sovereign over all of this. There's nothing I'm holding back from your will. A person can't say, for example, okay, God, I, I get this tithe thing, but 
10% is a little too steep, I'll give you 9%. You can't do it. It's not good enough. Or you can't say, well, God, I'll tithe the full 10%, but I'm going to have to bend on the Sabbath to keep my job in order to do it. I'm going to have to work on Friday nights to make this happen. No. No, God won't accept that. That's not a complete commitment. A man can't say, okay, well, I'm married. I, I won't commit adultery. And then on the other hand, say, but God, this whole thing of being patient with my wife, it's just too hard. She's too hard to deal with. I'm not going to be patient with her. I'm not going to grow in that way like you want me to. God won't accept that. It's not a wholehearted commitment. And therefore, it, it's not good enough. God requires we serve with all our heart and all our soul and all our strength, giving even 99.9%, .9 but intentionally holding back that other part is not good enough. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, we need to talk a little bit about what sin is just to lay a foundation for the message today. 1 John 3 and verse 4 gives us the most basic definition, the simplest definition of sin. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, we read, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin is to break the law of God, in the simplest terms we can put it. Verse 7, he says, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as Christ is righteous. And he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. In other words, it comes down to the things that we do, what we practice. You know, have you, have you ever noticed that you, you get pretty good at whatever you practice? Yeah, if we're, if we're practicing sin, we'll get good at sin. We don't want to do that. But if we want to be doing righteousness, we have to practice it. It's something that we grow into. To the best of our understanding, the calling then is to avoid sin and to adhere to God's law, to keep his commandments. Verses 5 and 6 in the same chapter assures us that Jesus Christ has no sin. Verse 5 says, in him there is no sin. He was manifest to take away our sins. And because there's no sin in him, he's capable of doing that. Verse 6 says, whoever abides in him does not sin, and whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Okay, so we can't have, we can't have sin. We can't have the breaking of God's law. We need to take a little step further and understand, well, well how far does God's law go? You know, how far do the commands go? Very often in the church of God, we consider what's called the spirit of the law as opposed to merely the letter of the law. And it bears on this conversation because sin is a lot deeper than our behavior and what we do or don't do. It gets into our thoughts and even our feelings. We'll see that. Let's turn to James chapter 1, a couple of books back. James 1, verses 12 through 15. Again, trying to understand what is sin. Does it go deeper than behavior? You know, when we talk about the spirit of the law, is that just a, a touchy feeling thing? Or, or can we really put our hands around what that means? James 1 and verse 12. James wrote, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who loved him. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. You know, that, that's very important to, to realize when we have temptations, we're supposed to endure them. We're going to have them, but there's a process of enduring it. That is, waiting it out without sinning. Verse 13 says, Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Okay, what is temptation exactly? Temptation is when we feel the desire to sin. And this is where sin begins. When you feel the temptation, there's only two things in the world you can do about it. Only two things. Either you go ahead and sin, or you endure until that temptation is passed. It's a binary choice. It's clear, then, from verse 13, that God allows our temptation. However, he clarifies the temptation is not from God. In other words, we have no room to say, well, if God you know, really cared about me doing this or not, he would just take away the desire for it. He just wouldn't allow me to be tempted. No. Or if God didn't want me to do this, then, then I wouldn't want to do it so bad. That's totally backwards thinking, contrary to Scripture. Verse 14 explains a little further. When each one is tempted, 
He's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. That shows the origin of sin. Again, it starts with our desires. We're drawn away by them and enticed. Really, the word for desires, a better translation of that word is lust. Something that points more towards not just desires. We desire a lot of things that are fine. It's really pointing towards evil desires is the connotation that the word in Greek carries. And the word enticed also carries with it the, the idea of being deceived being tricked. Especially, you know, what happens? We have a desire, and then if I, if I embrace that just a little bit and start to think about it, well, the rational mind, this beautiful creation that God made, that's capable of building buildings and putting man on the moon and all the other things that we do with this wonderful mind, that mind goes to work against us, rationalizing and coming up with excuses for sin until we have deceived ourselves. We have been enticed by the sin that we initially embraced a desire for. Verse 15 goes a little further. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. So when does sin become sin? Well, the analogy is to the start of human life with conception. Okay, when does human life begin? <laughs> when desire has conceived. Okay, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. There is a, a process that breaks down here. We, we can see that when we first have a desire, you, you know, we're blessed if we endure temptation. That means if we reject that desire, we're blessed. But if we have embraced that desire, and then we set our mind to the feeling to justify it, eventually we're going to act on it and do it. And now we see sin kind of from conception all the way to, to birth where it becomes a habit and leads to death because we're practicing lawlessness instead of practicing righteousness. Even before we've acted on it, it's already taken on life as sin. Sin, I like to say, operates at three basic levels. The level of our behavior. That's really the outcome as we've seen here. So taking a step back from that was the mind say the behavior level the thought level but really where it starts is in the heart at the heart level behavior is just that end product of a longer process of deeper sin that started somewhere choosing to participate in sin at any level has this awful negative synergy that these levels reinforce one another if I decide I'm gonna behave a certain way it's gonna affect my thinking and my feeling If I decide I'm gonna allow myself to think a certain way it affects the others in the same way if I let myself feel a certain way. You know, just as sin operates at multiple levels, repentance also must, therefore, operate at more than just the level of what we do or don't do. Repentance and obedience are deeper than behavior. It's the whole self. The whole self. Turn with me to Matthew 5 and verse 27, where Christ in the Sermon on the Mount discussed exactly this. The fact that the law goes further than just the letter of the command, further than just the outward physical behavior. He explained it this way in relation to adultery. In Matthew 5, verse 27, Christ said, You've heard it said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The sin had already taken place. Even if he never acted out adultery, he still had sinned through lust, the thoughts, and the desires. It's in the heart. This goes beyond the behavior level, obviously, to the thoughts and the feelings. In verse 21 and 22, he does the same thing with the sin of murder. You've heard it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders is in danger of judgment. But I say to you, Whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Now Christ was expounding on the law, teaching that, yes, it's much more than just the outward murdering of my brother. It starts with, in fact, the law itself says it this way. In Leviticus 19, it says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall not hate your brother in your heart doesn't mean there's no appropriate place for hate. You know, there's some things that God hates. He hates sin, for example. But to hate our brother in our heart, we are told plainly 
by the law of God all the way back in Leviticus. That that feeling used in that way is wrong. When we talk about putting our whole self in, it's not just keeping my hand from doing evil and making sure my hands are doing good. It's that whole self conversion that changes my heart. Today, society, people want to argue that you, know, you can't help your feelings, that feelings are the only truth that we have. Okay, it might truly reflect what we are, right, and how we think. But God says, there are some feelings you need to make sure and control yourself that you don't have. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. Reject that, God says. So we understand with God's law, we're not trying to just tick some boxes. We're trying to be something different and be different to the core. That involves doing differently, thinking differently, feeling differently until we, we are made different by God. God's the one who makes that difference. That's the transforming work of his Holy Spirit. He, he rebuilds us in this process. The key is we cannot justify sin or tolerate, tolerate sin in our life at any one of these levels. So repentance involves giving God the authority to decide right and wrong in every part of my life. That applies not just to my behaviors, but to my thoughts and deep down even to the things I feel. God has authority over that. Yes, my feelings can be wrong. Many times they are wrong. God's the one that corrects it. That's hard for us to do, hard for us to control. But with God, these things are possible. We have to know and agree what's right and wrong. Now, part of that, we, we decide. Okay, at some point, we've decided to give God the authority in principle. That doesn't automatically mean that we're done. You know, we, we then have to live up to that standard that we are entering into. That's part of our Christian walk. And it's a struggle, a lifelong struggle. It's a growth progress and process. It's something that we grow into. And sometimes we may find ourselves acting against the commitment we plainly made to God. Scripture speaks to that. Just like when you're married, you've made a commitment to that person, right, to love them until death and through whatever circumstances. If marriage is dissolved with the very first time that a couple got cross with each other, how many marriages would have lasted? <laughs> I, won't, I won't ask for a show of hands, but, but probably every married couple in this room has, has had some kind of fight where, where you were disappointed in your own behavior and didn't live up to the commitment that you had made of love. This is natural. This is human. Now, our covenant with God is with a perfect partner who never does that to us, but we are still imperfect creatures. Even if we made a wholehearted commitment, we can still fall short of acting out that commitment over the difficulties of life. But the first key to repentance is that in our commitment, we have to commit our whole self towards God's way. But let's step back and ask for a second, well, okay, this is a lot of talk about repentance, but we, did we talk about what repentance is? You know, what are the steps of repentance? Can we break it down anyway? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. You, you decide you're going to put your whole self in, and you've got to shake it all about. You do. Once the decision is made to repent, that decision is I'm going to change my, my mind, my outlook, I'm fully going to surrender to God's will, then the work starts. And it's a big shake-up and change to a person's life. Like Mr. Armstrong wrote, it is a definite experience. It is a change. And it's not one that's necessarily complicated, but it is one that can be hard for us as physical beings. So let's break it up. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13. In Proverbs 28, verse 13, it's a scripture that we, we cover in baptism counseling to understand how to repent. So I'll talk about that just a little bit. And it's short, it's pithy. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who covers his sins will not prosper. And we know this. We know that nothing is hidden from the sight of God that you know, if we sin with our, with our hands, then it can be seen by anyone, but the thoughts in the heart, God still sees those. They can't be covered over. Eventually, they'll give birth to other sin, and even if they didn't come out in our behavior, God still knows that if we try to cover it, we won't prosper. We won't be blessed. But whoever confesses and forsakes his sins will have mercy. So it's talking about repentance, but it gives us a couple of more words to play with. 
confesses and forsakes. We can see this as, as two different and distinct parts of the repentance process that we can focus on, that we can make sure if we have any question over whether we've repented or not, this will tell us in a little more granular detail. So let's talk first about confessing the sin. We see an example of that in Psalm chapter 32. Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2. So we'll focus on confessing the sin and then tie it in with forsaking the sin and really flesh out what repentance is. Psalm 32, verse 1, starts with the outcome that we want. Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2, sounds great. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, because we need that. Have to have it. We laid that out at the beginning. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there's no deceit. I think we all want that for ourselves. We, we all want to be right there, that blessed person whose iniquity is covered, who has no deceit in their spirit. We're not lying to God or ourselves about anything. How do we get it? Verse 4. Verse 4, we see an example to follow on this point of confession. David writes, Day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my vitality was turned into the drought of summer, and I acknowledged my sin to you. You know, David didn't just sit around and know he had done wrong. He acknowledged his sin to God. My iniquity I've not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Confessing to God is a necessary step and component in repentance. It's admitting our failure. It's an acknowledgement to God. It's not sweeping it under the rug. It's putting it in the open and doing it verbally before God. And it's important not to skip that. And it's a step it's a, a step that can be very difficult to say out loud to God the things we've done wrong. It's a step that will shake a person if we take it seriously. It requires us to come down low in humility and talking to God just like a little child has done something wrong. We are God's children. And I think any one of us, if we're honest, when we go to God after having done something wrong, we feel that way. We feel like a child that did something wrong. Confessing and saying what we did out loud is, is different than just deciding, oh, well, that was a misstep and trying to go about our way with God. I mean, if you ever try that in a human relationship, it, it's something that... I know our flesh is a lot more comfortable just pretending like nothing bad happened. The old quote goes, love means never having to say you're sorry. It's total baloney. Total baloney. God asks us to confess our sins, to put into words what we did wrong, to show that we understand it. But more than that, to, to treat our creator with respect as a person. I mean, if someone's done wrong against you deliberately really done you wrong, and then they come to you just expecting you to go along like everything's hunky-dory? But we normally don't take well to that. Why would God? We have to show the understanding and admission of wrong to God so that the relationship can be fully restored. If we know this in human relationships, it's even more true with God. He expects us to confess our sin, to treat him with that respect. But confession is one thing. Okay, that's the fruit of our lips. And it's important that we have it. But it's not the only thing. It's meaningless if it doesn't go along with that act of forsaking the sin that completes repentance. Forsaking the sin. If you haven't forsaken the sin, then your confession means nothing. So what does it mean to forsake sin? Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 11. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8. For one thing, we can say, <coughs> forsaking sin means that we agree that what we did was wrong. Okay, so we have to agree with God about his law, about the definition of right and wrong. That's an important first step. We have to be desiring not to have done the thing, committing that we will try not to do it again. But it's also supposed to be accompanied by emotion. Emotions have power. Emotions lead us towards action to ensure we follow through with change. That's why God gave them to us. We see an example of that in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8. 
Paul's writing to the Corinthians after having written 1 Corinthians to them, had a lot of rebukes over a lot of different things, a lot of chastisement, a lot of things they needed to repent of. And Paul writes to him this way in his follow-up. He says, even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I perceived the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a little while. And now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that sorrow led to repentance. So, so it's a, Paul's kind of funny way of saying, I, I didn't want you to feel bad, but what you were doing was bad, so I know to get right with God, you had to feel bad. So, so I'm rejoicing, not that you had to feel awful over what you did, but that because you felt awful, you were then restored to God. He elaborates on that. He says, For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So we see Paul explaining that this sorrow, this emotion, that guilt that we feel when we break God's law, when we violate our commitment and our covenant to him, we should feel bad because we did bad. But we're not supposed to wallow in that and get lost in that emotion. We're supposed to use the energy from that to do something different. The kind of sorrow that produces repentance leads to salvation, it says, and it's not to be regretted. It's kind of what Paul was saying at the outset of, of this passage. He was saying, you know, I, I, I didn't want you to feel bad, but I don't regret it because of what it led to. Verse 11 details what that is like, what that action is like that takes place after feeling this sorrow. Observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner and what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, and what vindication. In all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. You, you took that feeling of guilt and you, you allowed it to work in you for good by the power of God. Godly sorrow produces eternal life if we do the right thing with that emotion and put it into practice, into action. So the quick answer to how do I repent from breaking God's law? Well, when you've understood that you have done something wrong or you become aware of a wrong that you did, you forsake the sin by deciding to agree with God and to obey God from that point forward. You confess the sin to God and you ask for forgiveness. It's important to ask. And then we work better to do better the next time, knowing that God is the one who's going to help us overcome that sin by his spirit. We might have some questions. In fact, I, I hear these questions from our members from time to time. You know, this is material that's typically covered in baptism counseling. Um, many, many of us, it's, maybe we didn't cover this in baptism counseling, and or it's been a long time since that took place, and we haven't looked at the basic topic of repentance in a while, and, and doubts start to creep in. That happens to every person. So here, here are some of those that are common, I think. Here's a question. If I sin again after baptism, does that mean that God no longer wants me? Second Peter 3.9 summarizes. I'll just quote it. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So 2 Peter 3, 9. God wants everyone to come to repentance. Now, if, if we have, it, it depends on the situation, right? If, if I have stubbornly set my will against God and I've decided, God, I'm not going to obey you in this, not interested in obeying you in this, well, that's one thing. He cannot accept a person with that mindset. He just can't. He won't. But if you've turned... If you are desiring to set his will above yours, he'll always accept you. God desperately wants us. He desperately wanted us so badly that he sent Jesus Christ, his son, to die for our sins. He did that, it says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for, ungod for the ungodly. That was us. And do we think he wants us any less after we've taken the step to become his children? I mean, if, if human parents did that, you know, the first time the kid tells a lie, or does something wrong, we just said, well, this kid's a bust. Yes, I'll have another one. Try again the next time. Well, no. We don't stop loving our kids when they do wrong. 
It, it's ridiculous. It's funny because it's ridiculous. We don't think that way. To think that God thinks that way about us is equally ridiculous. For a parent, when we see a child having done something wrong and they come to us and, and they, they know, you know they, they have flipped that little switch where they've stopped being defiant, which might go on for a while, depending on the temperament of your child and the situation. As soon as we see that little turn of heart, does it not endear us to them? Is it any different with God the Father? Even when we chastise or punish children, the goal is always to get them to go the right way so that we can continue the relationship forward and give them a good life. This is precisely what God wants for us too. So no, if we've sinned after baptism, if we're still committed to God, God is going to faithfully restore us and continue with us. How about this one? If I keep struggling with the same sin again and again, does that mean that I never really repented? Does it mean that God will not forgive me because my heart was never really in it? I've talked to a lot of people in God's church. I think that anyone that I've had a real heart-to-heart -heart with would say they, they've struggled with this thought, that they've had some sin that they have struggled with and fought with time and again and they've not always upheld their commitment to God the way they wish they could have. And it makes us wonder, it makes us question ourselves, question our own sincerity sometimes. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. 1 John 1 and verse 8, it's instructive for us. <clears throat> John here is writing to the church as a whole. It's a general epistle written to a general audience of members of the body of Christ. And in verse 8, to us, the body of Christ, believers who have God's Holy Spirit in them, who have committed our lives to God, he says this, if we say we have no sin, he even puts himself in the mix. We, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In other words, as long as we're here in the flesh, we are going to have problems with sin as hard as we try to avoid it. We're just imperfect. But verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is something that, yes, happens in a, a special way at baptism, the cleansing and forgiveness of baptism, but it's also something we enter into a process with God where he faithfully does this every time we confess and repent whenever we have need of it. In verse 10, he reiterates, if we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is written to the church. On some level, in some way, we all do continue to sin. We learn to do better over time. It's important we see even, even then continuing to confess our sins. We might get lulled into complacency after we've been baptized for a while, after we've struggled with a sin for a while after we've done the same thing for the 10th, 20th, 30th time and come back to God over it? We might get that temptation to stop confessing it, to stop treating it seriously. It has to be treated seriously every time with God. That's how we eradicate sin from our lives. And you know what? E even if we deal with this or that sin, we're going to face whole new sets of trials and temptations and, and, and sins that we might have to deal with throughout a lifetime. You know why? Because you're going to get a different job in a different environment. Or you're going to live in a different place with a different set of struggles. Or you just get older and your desires change. You have new desires you never felt before just because of time and circumstance. And those new tests might reveal part of us that's uglier than we want to see. If we continue to strive against sin, you know, having forsaken it, having put our whole self in, in entering the covenant. God continues in grace towards us. He continues to help us grow and develop. So no, it doesn't mean that, that God had not forgiven me because I'm still struggling with the same sin. We have to struggle against it until we overcome it. There's nothing else to do but struggle against it or give up. And giving up is not an option if we want eternal life. And you know, really, it's, it's a personal question. 
that, that only the individual facing the situation can answer when it comes to our own personal sin. Here are some criteria based on what we've talked about. You know, first of all, can we say, well, do we agree with the law, that God's law is right and good? If I still agree with God about what's right and wrong, that's a good first step. God can start to work with that. Secondly, I can always ask, am I sorry that I sinned against God? Do I wish I had done different? Do I wish I could be different? We've got to be able to answer yes to that. If we could change what we just did, would we? We can ask ourselves that. And are we going to try not to do that same thing again? Take some kind of positive action in our lives to, to avoid whatever that sin or temptation is, to protect ourselves from that situation. You know, we're, we're pretty predictable creatures sometimes. We're faced with the same set of circumstances that led to a particular sin. Better that we don't walk down that road again. Better that we not put ourselves in a position to be tempted again, if we can identify the source of that. As the Day of Atonement's approaching, I just want us all to step back and consider if these things speak to us. Have we been following God faithfully in a lifestyle of whole self-repentance? When we sin, do we still confess it to God every time when we become aware of it? Or do we get in the habit of thinking, well, God, God knows that's not who I am. I can just move on with my day. Treat it flippantly. Or when we're faced with long battles of sin, do we find ourselves getting discouraged? We need to evaluate our sincerity against those criteria of for forsaking sin and, and be sure, be sure we agree with God about what's good, about his way being best, not my own, and making the necessary changes to my actions and my thoughts and even my feelings, knowing where I'm going wrong and trying to correct it so that God can correct who we are at that deeper character level, which is where all those things really flow from, and what God is ironing out. Indeed, we put our whole self in at baptism, but it takes a lifetime of fulfilling that commitment, ongoing action to adhere to the, the commitment we made to God. We need to understand and practice these elements of repentance. Put our whole selves in and shake it all about whenever it's needed and leave no doubt at all in our minds about our commitment and our resolve to follow God's way. Double down on it again and again. We have to keep going and remember what it is all about. It's about turning ourselves around, turning ourselves to God's way, away from sin and death, and turning ourselves to God and into his kingdom forever.